Um, so the basic idea is that we're going to talk um, every week. Each time uh, a different group will provide uh, half an hour of uh, interesting talks. And um, I'm hoping that we'll start sort of to uh, integrate it into our daily, into the daily tasks that we do. We'll start thinking, is, it, is this something I can talk about? Is, it, is this something I can share? It doesn't have to be um, just about your work. It can also be about something in your life, if you have life outside of your work. Um, so it doesn't have to be anything uh, like, uh, it doesn't have to be a TED talk, in short. So um, without further ado, I'll start with the first uh, uh, presentation, which is mine. Later, uh, uh, Victor will talk. And I'm recording this, so uh, in case you're not here, then you'll be able to listen to it uh, later. Anything you want to say before we start? Okay, um, so let's see. <clears throat> Can everybody see my screen? Yep, yes, yep, yeah, yep. you're alive. Uh, thanks. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, an interesting problem I had uh, last week, and um, I think a nice way to solve it. And the problem was uh, related to iterables in Python. So I don't know how many of you worked with uh, iterables in Python, but um, you might uh, know that they are tricky. So um, let's take a look at this uh, short snippet of code. <clears throat> so we have a list called strings with four numbers, and we convert it using map and the function int, which converts strings into numbers. And you call we have a, a new list called int. And then we can filter that list into two different uh, lists, one for the even numbers and one for the odd numbers. And if we take a look at the even numbers, then we see that we have two and four in the even numbers and one and three in the odd numbers, and it's pretty cool. Um, so that's quite understandable. But if I retry that same experiment, I get a different result. So it's exactly the same code, but when I try to run uh, the same code, I get that odds is suddenly an empty list. Does anybody know uh, what's the difference between the first snippet and the second snippet? Okay. <clears throat> so I tell I do, I do. Oh, yeah. Interaction. So what's that? <laughs> is it? Is this something to do with generators? So the generators exhausted. Exactly. So, so the first snippet, the, the one at the beginning, the one that returned the, the cool results, is the Python 2. And the second snippet is the same code, but running in Python 3. And what, happened, what happens, basically, is that uh, in Python 3, map is no longer a list. It doesn't return a list. It returns an iterable. And that means that you can iterate through it once, and once you finished iterating through it, it's, do it's gone. I mean, the, the data is gone. It doesn't, hold, um, it doesn't hold the data. So if I take a look at the class or the type of, of, of what map is returning me, returning me, it's not a list anymore. It's something called map, which is basically a, a, an iterator on the original list. So, um, and if we take a look at, at, the, at the methods it has, I see it has two special methods, one called iter and one called next, which basically make this uh, class an iterable. Um, and the idea with iterables is, is very simple. It's just instead of creating a new list and, and wasting more memory, you can just uh, have a lazy representation of that map. 
So if you never iterate through it or never never consume the data, then that list is never created. Um, and we, it's very useful in Python, but it can also be tricky because, again, once you iterate through it once, you can't iterate through it again. Um, so let's see how it works. I get, a, a, again, the strings and the ints, and I can call next on the ints, and each time I get a new number, and when the, uh, the, the source of, of the iterator, which is basically the original list, is exhausted, then uh, an exception is thrown called stop iteration, which means that we don't have any, um, any more items in that iterable. Um, so for all of you that know Python, should understand it really easily, and for the rest of you, um, it's basically magic. Uh, as long as you get it, that's uh, that's important bit. So that was sort of a primer to, to iterators. And the problem I had was related to loading data into basically into a database in open spending. And in open spending, we want to load the data row by row. We don't want to load the entire data set, which could be uh, quite big, gigabytes of data. We don't want to load it uh, to memory um, all at once. So we want to load the data row by row. And we have pretty nice frictionless data libraries that help us. So here's, here is a very simplified uh, code snippet. We basically take the uh, data package and we write the um, oops. We, we write the, the resource, the first resource to it. So it, you can see I'm calling the iter method for the first resource, which basically gives me an iterator. And storage write reads that iterator row by row and writes it to the database. And every row that's written, it also uh, returns it to uh, to the user. So this is sort of a pull chain. I'm pulling data from the writer, and for each row that I'm pulling from the writer, in turn, it's pulling data from the data package, and that data package can be pulling the, that data from the network. So it's basically a pull chain that I'm pulling data out, out of it, and each time I'm pulling data out of it, it's sort of pulling that entire chain uh, by one row. And this is great. I mean, it's really a nice architecture. Um, so what's the problem? The problem is that I wanted to write to multiple tables at the same time. Basically, uh, I wanted to normalize the data. So we have one primary table, which is the um, row that you see above. It has an ID uh, of one, and it has a value of 3,000 euros. And it has two pointers to two other tables, which I will call secondary tables. One of them, for example, is a function classification table, and the other one is an economic classification table. And each one of them holds um, different classi classifications. For example, all the functional classifications and all the functional, all the economic classifications. It should be much more efficient in space and also much more performance. Um, and I also want to do that writing to these tables row by row. I don't want to uh, read all the data and write one of the tables and then write another. I mean, I want to be able to do that same thing, but again, row by row. So what's the problem? Um, we want to do this uh, theoretical flow. Uh, read one row from the input, push it to all the secondary tables, get the IDs of the rows I've just written, and then uh, use these IDs to sort of compose the new row for the primary table. And when I have that row, I can push it to the primary table. So is that understandable? Do you have any questions about this theoretical flow? Just to make sure you're still alive. I'm alive, but I don't have any questions. OK. Thank you. <clears throat> so what's the problem with this, with this flow? So the, the main problem is, is, is where I say at some point. Because the way that the writer works, it doesn't necessarily um, emit a written row every time I push it a new row because it has internal buffering and I could it could read even a thousand rows from the source before starting to emit uh, written rows because it buffers uh, SQL uh, statements 
um, before um, and, and not writing every row directly to the database. Also, this is not no longer a pull chain. This is a push chain. So I'm pushing data into the database and sort of breaks the entire architecture. So I want to do this sort of sort of uh, implement this flow, but using a pool chain, like with iterables. Um, and how do I do that? And to make things a little bit clearer, I hope, yeah, I have a, a, a chart. So what I want to have is, is a, a source of rows, which is what we said before, like, um, the iterable that's coming out of the data package. And then I want the secondary writers, the, the writers uh, that write to the secondary tables to read from that row source and, and write to that, um, to the secondary DB tables. And when they're done, I wanna, I wanna read one uh, result from each of these secondary writers and also the, a row from the original source and combine them together and write them to the primary writer. So this is the flow I wanna, I wanna have and where each of these arrows is actually a pull, a pull action. I'm pulling data out of the arrow and getting more data. So the main problem here is how do I split an iterator? Because we said that I can only read it once. I can't read it twice or, 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 or two times or three times or how much I need here. So what I needed to implement is basically um, something that can split an iterator. Not only split it, but also um, account for buffering. Because let's, for example, say um, that one of these writers has a buffer of five rows. That means that when I read from it, um, when I read a line from it, it will already process five rows from the source. The other writer could have a buffer of 1,000 rows, which means that it will need 1,000 rows to be basically pushed to it before it emits the first, uh, the first output. So I need to account for this buffering and, and be able to, um, to allow different iterators with different bufferings to, be, to, be, um, to work together, basically. And this is a solution. It's just two slides of code. So uh, <clears throat> I hope you bear with me. And I'm doing it pretty quickly. So the basic uh, um, element here is, is a, an iterator called uh, reader. And you can see that it has a very simple, uh, um, very, very simple algorithm. Basically, it has a queue. And each time uh, the user wants a new item, it tries to get an item from the queue. If it doesn't have an item from the queue, it calls a magic function called refill which is supposed to add items to that queue. Um, and after calling refill, we can be certain that we have items in the queue and we just return the first item in the queue. So this is a very simple iterator just that just uh, gives item out of a, out of a queue, basically. Um, so that's the first half of the solution. And the second half is what I called uh, iterator splitter. Um, which is a class that has a method called get that generates uh, readers that we saw before and implements uh, the refill. Now what, what does the refill do? It takes an item from an iterator, which is one iterator, for example, the road source that we saw before. And whenever uh, a refill is called, it takes one item from the um, from the source and just push it, pushes it to all the queues of all the readers. So that each one, each time um, one of the readers is basically out of data, that item is pushed to all the queues of all the readers. So that all of them have a, a queue of rows that is waiting for them to, uh, to be read. And that's basically it. I mean, it's quite simple. But it allows all of these readers to work with the same iterator um, and still maintain that pool uh, mechanism. And even the primary and the secondary um, writers use basically just the same 
uh, rose source. That's it. So, are there any questions? Um, um, I I don't understand how how you avoid uh, having the same row end up uh, processed multiple times by different readers. So so all the readers basically want to process all the rows. Um, it, I'm not trying to uh, um, distribute the rows between the readers, but I want all the readers to process all of the rows in the in the source. Um, it, it's just that each reader sort of has a different uh, uh, a different speed, you could call it. It's not exactly speed, but you could call it a different speed. So you have to have a buffer to, so to, to um, so to accommodate uh, or to compensate for all those uh, for all those different readers that have different speeds or different internal buffers, but basically I want all the readers to see all the all the rows in the same order. Okay. Just for um. Just one thing that you, the example you gave of, um, <coughs> of, an, of an iterator is really common throughout all of Python 3, um, which some people know, obviously, but uh, also things like deep items and a bunch of other methods that in Python 2 return lists uh, and now return iterators for the same potential and also the same problem is present. Yeah, this is what just a, a, a very short example of uh, the differences that sometimes are unexpected, especially if that map is generated like three pages of code uh, before you actually use it. And then you, you're you surprised to find out that all the data is gone and you don't know why. <clears throat> okay. So um, just uh, one just one thing before you move on, Adam. Yeah. I also just put a link in the um, tech channel to a pretty famous um, paper by David Beasley on currency in Python. Um, it's a pretty mind blowing um, presentation. I recommend everyone to read it. It deals with in part with some of the things that you're dealing with here, especially. Um, you can even focus in on like page 43, 44, which starts to talk about um, building pipeline, the branch, and then join back together. Um, so that's just a reference for anyone who's interested. Cool. Um, okay, so now, um, Victor, are you ready? Do you need uh, to share your screen? Uh, I am ready and I need to share my screen. Okay, so making you a presenter. Okay. I need to download an extension. Oh. <laughs> can you can you see my screen? Um Yes, we can. Okay. Great. All right. So uh, I'll try to be fast. Um, I created a small uh, node GitHub uh, repository with all the background and linking to a blog post I put together a few weeks ago on introduction to node debugging. So I'm going to stick to uh, demonstrating the things here. Uh, just a small uh, side thing. Realize that GitHub sticks the license here if you put a copying file, which is kind of nice. All right, so let's move on. Um, I have this uh, JSON. So this is a node repository that doesn't do much. It's just an express application uh, with the default route and outputs a hello world on it. And the main thing I want to show here is that I have uh, a bunch of scripts. I have a start script, which is running the index file 
on port 3000. A debug script that is the same thing, just opens up a debugging port and inspect um, inspect a script that does more or less the same thing as debug does, but uh, using the Chrome browser in the process. So, <laughs> another one. <laughs> um, now, getting to the index.js file itself. Can you see, uh, I need to zoom in a bit. All right. Um, it's just a require express and on default route, I have a breakpoint set here uh, with uh, using the, the, the QR debugger. I'm going to start the app. Oh. oh. That's because it's running already. Cool. And if I go here on localhost 3000, let's see, hello world. Mm -hmm. That's not very useful. So in order to make it more useful, I move this thing away, it doesn't hide. Okay, let's do this. Um, I'm going to npm run debug. And we can see it's doing the same thing. It's starting up only if I far up a request here is uh, stuck waiting. What does this mean? This means I can go here and say node debug localhost, update pilate. And now debugger is connected. And there's a bunch of commands here. You can type help and see the commands. And probably the most useful command available is the REPL. And REPL is read, evolve, print loop which means you basically get a prompt inside the app. And it's not very uh, useful in this scenario because my app doesn't do much. But I don't know, I can see type of S is an object and see inside of it, it's pretty big. So I'm expecting it to be invaded with a lot of properties, yeah. Uh, but I can also come here and uh, I'm not sure if I can do this should be possible to send a reply and say, is it hacked? And yes, it is. So uh, this is how you can uh, get inside the, the scope of your function, inside the scope of your breakpoint, and use that context to inspect the elements in and uh, do some modifications without relying on the dreaded console log, console trace, and its friends that always end up uh, generating some tech debt to remove them from the repository. Okay, now, the whole thing, control C to break out of here. I don't need this debugger because this debugger is useful but kind of ugly if you have long objects like this. And this is, this is a giant object. So I'm going to npm run inspect. As you can see here, Inspect is uh, doing the same thing, just running with a different flag. And here's a link. I'm going to copy it. I can't make my Chrome to, to open it directly. And I come here, fire up a request. And here I am in the browser console. Going to zoom in a bit. I can see the response. Nice, expandable, collapsible, easy to investigate object. And I can do uh, more or less the same things as in the console, but with uh, the big advantages. I see the code while I work on it. I see the files. I can place, I can dynamically set debuggers. Uh, and there's a lot of buttons here. You might want to uh, go over them and see what they do. It's a fairly easy process to get used to. It's just probably the hardest step is to get in here. And the blog post that is linked in, into the repository is hopefully, yeah, it's uh, pointing the steps to go and enable node debugging inside Chrome slash Chromium browsers. Uh, by the way, this blog post is uh, 
using OpenTrails API as a demo, so might be interesting to see some different context. I can come here and send uh, another response and see it works. It's just another way to interact with uh, uh, the node context using the debugging protocols. And if we successfully attach to the debugger port, you can see the message in the terminal that the debugger is attached. When I kill it, it moves on and crashes. Um, OK. I think that's the basic thing. Uh, what I wanted to point out is that we have an npm debug.log file that is created by uh, debugging, which means my git ignore would reflect this. And this is generated by uh, gitignore.io. I strongly recommend it to bootstrap gitignore files from very, very uh, common templates. This is the node template, and uh, it's generating a lot of things you want to avoid adding. Make sure you have the debugging enabled in your browser. I'm going to show it. Oh, not here. I'm going to show it to you really, really fast. Because my view is not here. No. Settings. Experiments. And when you get here, you have to do this trick. And um, oh, no, this is the, the experiments you have to Chrome. There's a Chrome flags, enabled dev tools experiments. This is the first step. This is enabled. All right. And here should be no debugging. And there was a thing I noted in the blog post, I think, for, uh, OK, you have to press Shift a couple of times. And if it's not enabled, you should be able to enable it here. OK. And make sure your ports are free and accessible. That's pretty much it. Um, are there any questions regarding node debugging? My environment. Hi, Victor. Um, yeah. The, the debug, so you put a debugger statement in that um, app dot get. If you don't run it with the debug flag, does, is that statement just ignored? Uh, yes. Okay. It's and, for, however, I don't recommend letting them in there for uh, just sitting in a code in case you want to debug it. So it's still annoying. Yeah. It's less annoying than a console log that actually does something that uh, pollutes the log files. So if you forget one of these in, uh, it, it's not very bad. As a nice thing to do, you might want to run with the inspect flag and don't put any debugger statements. Just run it with inspect, and when you get inside the browser, uh, the Chrome DevTools node debugger, uh, you set up breakpoints dynamically in that interface and then restart uh, fire up or under another request. And, so, the, and the inspect flag in Node, is that, um, is that native to Node or is that an extension that's used? It is, it is native to Node, but I can't really tell you which version of Node starts from. I'm running 694, which is uh, around the latest LTS, I think it's 6.9.5 or whatever. Um, on previous versions, it might not be. haven't checked that. I think that that was my experience when I was trying debugging, that it used to be a, an extension that you installed or, or, or a separate module. Uh, I, I didn't have a lot of luck with no debugging and kind of gave up on it. But this does, you do have made it look simpler, so maybe it's, a, it's become a bit easier to do in more recent versions. Oh. I, I have some similar uh, memories about trying to debug in the browser and having to install a browser extension for it. And now it's it's built in, it's baked inside the browser. But you still have to enable it from the experimental features. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah.
I have a question about the so uh, now uh, you have the route, uh, like index route, the root route. How would you uh, debug another route? Well, you'd have to create another route, so debug another route. So. Okay, but how do you tell the debugger to to enter that function instead of? For example, if this was uh, an about route, I'd go to about and routing. This is very very basic express routing model, uh, and a lot of node frameworks are based on express and they have their own routing uh, mechanisms on top of this. So you would have to find the place that runs your code inside the whatever framework you're using. Uh, generally, to give a concrete example, in OpenTrails API and Explorer, we have happy framework. And the best place, if you want to investigate what happens inside the route, is start from the handler, uh, which is pretty much what happens uh, here in, in this context. And then move on to whatever middleware sent, uh, you know, what you're investigating. But this is a very, very simple example. Uh, the most useless app you can have, uh, an express app that says Hello's, hello world. It, it, it's very, uh, very much varying. Depends on what app you have. All right, this is pretty silent. Any other questions on writing stuff? Thanks a lot, Victor. Yeah, thank you for watching. <laughs> uh, make sure to go on GitHub repo and blog post if you want to know more, or ask me. That's the very basic of it. You can go wild from here and use more commands and more flags. Thanks, Victor. That was really awesome. And yeah, really useful. I think we're out of time. Um, but uh, I'm really, really eager to hearing the talks next week. And that's it, I guess. Any other comments before we close this session? Um, I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks for organizing it, Adam, and for the big talk. It's really great that we have a, a new setup. And I look forward to all the future talks. Great. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks. I'm very happy to see this. <laughs> so go ahead. Cool. I was just expressing my happiness to see the Tech Talks rebooted. Yeah, <laughs> I'm happy as well. So um, I'll see you guys all uh, next week. And thanks for joining. Thanks. And everyone for frictionless data sprint planning, just stay on this call. Um, so, Adam, that means don't, don't end the call when you leave. Okay, I'll just stop the recording. <laughs>